In this video, we're going to focus on the representations we use to depict the structures and dynamics of excited states in photochemical reactions and photophysical processes. And the focus really in this introductory video is on the representational conventions used and, and less on the underlying reasons why things happen the way they do. So you're going to see a lot of terms on the slides that follow. There's going to be a lot of representations happening, and I want you to to the extent that you can, I often find myself having a hard time doing this, but to the extent that you can, resist resist asking the why question. Resist asking why things happen the way they do. We'll get to that. The focus for the time being is on the representations. Let's start with electronic excitation. And here we do actually need to introduce a little bit about why things happen. So when a molecule is excited to a higher electronic state. What exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, there's exactly what we just said. The molecule accepts or gains energy as the result of absorption of a photon, for example. And to a zero order approximation, we can represent electronic excitation as the elevation of the energy of an electron from a lower state to a higher state, or put another way, the electron moves from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital. And so what we can do is start with the ground state orbital picture. For example, the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, may be involved. We can start with this picture. We can grab one of these electrons and promote it from the HOMO to the LUMO and draw an orbital occupation diagram that looks a lot like what we started with, just with one electron in each orbital instead of two in the lower energy orbital and one in the higher energy orbital. This is a higher energy electronic state of the molecule, and now we have what we might call singly occupied molecular orbitals, or SOMOs. There's one that is lower in energy, and we could call that the SOMO L, and there's one that is higher in energy, and we could call that the SOMO H, and we might represent this orbital occupation situation with an asterisk around the Lewis structure, indicating that this is an excited state of this molecule. Now, the excitation of lowest energy corresponds to exciting an electron from the HOMO to the LUMO, because these orbitals are the closest filled and empty orbitals in energy within a molecule that can be shown logically quite easily, right? There are filled orbitals below the HOMO and empty orbitals above the LUMO, all associated with larger energy gaps. So the HOMO-LUMO transition, because it's the lowest in energy, is very often of interest to us. Now, first order corrections are going to complicate this picture, and the first complication, which I'll just mention at this point, is that this implies or assumes that the orbital energies are the same before and after photo excitation. But as soon as we start moving electrons around, and that's exactly what light does as an electromagnetic wave, the nuclei may change positions and the orbitals will change in structure and energy. And so the configuration of an excited state in terms of the orbitals available is not in general the same as the ground state. However, to a zero order approximation, this is a safe bet. And it, it actually works quite well for a, a variety of organic molecules to assume this. Now, Electron spin is also important to consider here, and we have ignored the idea of electron spin so far by representing just electrons as, as dots, right, without up or, or down spin. There's a difference between the state in which the spins of the electrons in the SOMOs are parallel, which is shown here, notice the two up arrows here, and the state in which the spins are anti-parallel, which is shown on the right. Notice that this is an upspin in the SOMO L and a downspin in the SOMO H. The state on the left, with the spins parallel, is called the triplet state. And the reason it's called a triplet will become apparent in due time for the time being. Just note that the spins are parallel. This is the triplet state. And the anti-parallel spin state is called the singlet state. And all ground state organic molecules with very, very, very few exceptions are singlets um, because electrons are paired and paired electrons must have opposite spins according to the Pauli exclusion principle. And so 
Excited states, however, may be singlets or triplets now that we have two half-filled or, or singly occupied molecular orbitals in the structure. This simple two-level model of excitation is going to take us very far in understanding the structures and dynamics of organic excited states in particular. And so it's worth committing to memory, at least for time be the time being, how we represent excited states as having singly occupied molecular orbitals in which one electron has been elevated from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital. And we've actually left the scaffold of molecular orbitals in terms of their energies and shapes alone. Let's briefly talk about photophysical transitions. So recall that we define photophysics or a photophysical process as one that converts an excited state to a, to a different excited state or back to the ground state without chemical change, without bonds made or broken. So this is what we refer to as a photophysical transition. Any process that an excited state engages in that does not change its chemical structure. Now, there's a lot going on in this figure right here, but this is an important representation that we use to depict photochemical transition, so we'll want to unpack it. The first thing to recognize is, first of all, what's going on with the axes. And here, really, only the y-axis has meaning, and the meaning is energy. This is an energy scale. The higher up we are, the higher the state. And this is a state energy diagram. Let's get that straight right here. So here we're with, with each of the horizontal lines, we're looking at the energy of a particular state. And there are a wide variety of photophysical transitions that we'll look at in detail very shortly in the course. Um, for the time being, I won't go through them all. I, all I will mention is a couple of important distinctions between the different types of photophysical processes. The first is this distinction between radiative and non-radiative. And let's actually use highlighting to distinguish between these two types of transitions. So radiative transitions I'm going to highlight in, let's do green. And these are transitions that involve the absorption or emission of a photon. And they're represented on the diagram using solid lines. So one is the absorption of a photon, for example. Three is the emission of a photon from the S1 singlet state. We can also have absorption and emission from or to triplet states. So absorption of a photon to access the triplet state is shown here. Emission of a photon from the triplet state to return to the singlet ground state is shown here. These are radiative transitions because a photon is absorbed or emitted in these transitions. Now, Logically speaking, if a radiative transition involves absorption or emission of a photon, a non-radiative process does not, and the squiggly lines that you see on this diagram represent non-radiative transitions. So for example, here we're seeing the non-radiative relaxation of the first excited singlet state, S1, back down to the ground state, S0, the singlet zero state. Here we're seeing relaxation without emission of a photon of the triplet state back to the singlet ground state. We also often see what's called intersystem crossing from a singlet state to a triplet state. That's this diagonal squiggly line here, and you can see it represented as process six in the diagram. And photochemical reactions, to some extent, can be thought of as non-radiative transitions. Because, of course, there's this gray area where the excited state is undergoing change en route to photochemical reaction, but it's not quite broken its bonds yet, right? And so the theory of non-radiative transitions does apply to photochemical reactions to some extent. So for example, here we're seeing a photochemical reaction with this curved arrow from the singlet S1 state, the first excited singlet state, to a singlet intermediate. And here we're seeing conversion of the first excited triplet state to a triplet intermediate. It's actually not crazy to think of these as non-radiative processes to some extent, and we may see that coming back later in the course. So let's again sum up what we're seeing here on the state energy diagram. So the y-axis is energy. Each horizontal line corresponds to an electronic state. These are often labeled with S or T for singular or triplet, and then a number, a subscript number, to represent the relative energy of the state, S0, S1, S2, S3, etc., and the same for the triplet manifold. 
we can represent both radiative and non-radiative processes. Non-radiative processes often use this squiggly line, and we can also sort of obliquely represent photochemical reactions as transitions off of a state to, for example, uh, an intermediate, a singlet or triplet intermediate. So the state energy diagram is, is very important. It, it tells us a lot about relative energies, and we will come back to state energy diagrams to understand the relative energies of singlet and triplet states, how that influences reactivity, how that is influenced by structure, and the implications of that for photochemical uh, reactivity. So this is really a foundational tool for understanding photophysics and photochemistry, and it's one worth committing to memory. The other thing we're often interested in is relative rates of these various processes. So let's be honest, there's a lot going on here, right? And there is a lot that an excited state can do. This is going to be a general theme of this course. There are a wide variety of processes available to any given excited state. And so we are very interested in the relative rates of these various processes, and in particular, which rates dominate, which rates have the highest K values under a, a particular um, situation for a particular structure, for example. We're going to be talking about relative rates a great deal throughout this course, and at least thinking through them, right? Committing K values to memory is not something you're going to want to do. What you're going to want to do is appreciate how structure influences relative K values and makes certain processes faster than others. You'll also hear the term Jablonski diagram used to represent either a state energy diagram or a diagram that you see right here. And this diagram is actually very similar to what we just looked at. The only difference between this and what we looked at on the last slide is that now the x-axis actually has meaning. And to some extent, now this is, there's, there's huge dimensionality reduction occurring here very often if we're talking about a large organic molecule, but more or less, this x-axis represents to some extent the nuclear coordinates. So we're still looking at the energies of various electronic states of a molecule, but in this picture, we are also seeing the shape of the potential energy surface associated with that state. And these will look like parabolas or sometimes parabolas with kind of a trailing off end if we're talking about anharmonic um, vibrational states. And further out to the right generally implies longer bond lengths, right? A, a structure that is held together more loosely. And so, for example, you can see S0, S1 moving out further to the right means that the bonds are weaker and the atoms are further apart in S1 than they are in S0. And likewise for the triplet state, although the triplet state may have its own kind of completely independent set of, of axes uh, here just to set them apart from the singlet state because very often these are profoundly overlapping uh, and so it's, it's difficult to graph them all you know, in, in one sort of vertical stack. The other thing you're seeing here are the vibrational levels. So these horizontal lines within each kind of parabolic looking manifold are the various vibrational levels of that electronic state. And generally speaking, organic molecules have many of these, right? Every infrared absorption corresponds to a particular vibrational mode and we can excite that multiple times. So organic molecules have access to a wide variety of vibrational states and thinking about vibrational states is actually very important for understanding in particular radiationless transitions. Radiative transitions to some extent as well, but for radiationless transitions, these vibrational levels are key, as we will see later.